All right, gang, we've been sent a case on the upper left-hand side, Edentulus site number 14. Uh, this case has been submitted to us, and the uh, notes on the case say uh, tooth number 14 was upper left, the first molar tooth number 14 was removed approximately three and a half months ago. At the time of tooth removal, it was just root tips and was removed and grafted with socket preservation, collagen plug, and PRF membrane or PRF plug over the top of the collagen uh, membrane uh, and now patients back ready to move to the next step of a dental implant uh, so um, my first question is going to be uh, well let's go to my second question first is uh, uh, what kind of guide are we going to use uh, we have the digital workflow analog workflow I look at this tooth we work on the upper arch there's no restorations to speak of on the upper arch so this is totally a digital workflow here we can see that we took a adequate scan um, for a a digital digi guide or a ser guide too. If we were doing an opti guide, I would prefer to see a little bit more cross arch to get up to the first molar to allow me to use a bite block to help hold the guide in and/or the isolite to hold the guide in and to serve as a throat pack. Um, here we can see our restoration. So let's go ahead and begin by walking through uh, our evaluation of the restoration itself, or the virtual wax up, I should say. Um, So my first um, comment on this, uh, let's see here, okay. So my first comment here would be based on what we're seeing on the adjacent teeth. I think it'd be clear to say that that gingival margin is a little bit too high uh, based on you know, the adjacent teeth we probably want our gingival margin to be right there, <coughs> excuse me, but we know that with the soft tissue defect it won't be that high, but I think it's clear to say it could probably be about right here. And the reason that it's important is to be able to choose the apical position. Uh, I prefer and like to choose the apical position based on the gingival margin and also to help make sure I design enough running room or emergence room for the implant to uh, phase into the restoration. And looking at it uh, from an occlusal view, we can see that it's uh, pretty well done here. Um, again, also on the lingual margin, here you can also see that um, our gingival margin was not so well done right there. So probably more along that line. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a tickle today. Um, more along this line right here to allow for... Um, uh, better visualization of running room there. Um, occlusally, it's well done. If we take a look again, we can see that um, well, I'm not on my game today, apologize. So we can see right here and right there that our uh, buccolingual width looks good. And we can see that our central groove is pretty much in alignment right here. It's the other thing I look at and we can see that our marginal ridges are good and so other than the margin um, drawing on the buccal and lingual I think this is a good virtual wax up uh, next let's look at the plan as it was submitted um, actually before I go that I want to go through the, my bigger one of my other concerns here is that uh, at this stage on the posterior maxilla and a grafted site I'm just not a big fan of moving forward at three and a half, four months. I like to really wait a solid four, five, sorry, five, five or six months. And one of the reasons is you can see here there's a defect that looks like it's this big. And we don't know uh, if that defect, where uh, the coronal aspect of that defect will uh, fill into. So I like to see full fill in. And then the other thing I look at here is we see a little bit of a dip here in the sinus floor. And then also when we're looking at this, here we can also see that dip so we can see that there was probably a dip membrane uh, you can see where the roots were probably like this and like that so the grafting was done well and not that you would do anything I would do anything different here but you can see that the sinus membrane was in between the teeth in a perfect world we would have done a little bit of lift at the time of uh, removal uh, but that's easier to do now than at that time and then the only other question I have back to my point about um, 
uh, where the uh, coronal aspect will be is I can kind of see a faint shadow that that coronal aspect will be right here but the better part of the ridge in terms of more dense looks right there so this is the area where we're just a little unsure what's going to happen there so uh, just some food for thought uh, keep in mind as we're um, uh, planning our implant here's the plan that was submitted to us um, it's a 5 by 10 and uh, generally looking if you look at it from the occlusal aspect here it looks pretty well centered but uh, this is where I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about finessing your implant plans uh, does this implant plan work? Yes. Uh, I would personally be a little bit uncomfortable with this plan. Uh, mainly, as I see it, uh, I say we have so much room on the lingual. Why do we get so skinny on the buckle here? So, um, you know, that that's one thing I see. Also, you know, that's a pretty decent size sinus lift to try to do here on a wavy sinus floor. So I'd probably try to err on the side of 5.5 by 8.5 uh, millimeter implant. And then our apical bone level position, again, this comes back to my earlier point, you can kind of see the bone level right here, but we don't know, and I can see why it's planned here, because that's where our density of bone looks good. But we can kind of see that our bone is going to be right here, or hopefully be right there. So based on that, I would probably want to move this implant coronally about like so, and then that makes our sinus lift a little bit less so maybe we could go to the 10 millimeter implant then and that's a pretty predictable straightforward uh, internal sinus bump then uh, again the buckle being so thin compared to the lingual I would go ahead and kind of center that in the ridge and in doing so what that does is it moves us to the lingual of the restoration so then I would just simply tilt my implant at the head and or at the um, apex and get that better centered so you know generally speaking everything looks great here um, you know but here this is where I want to get a little bit more critical that is a long axis of that route long axis of that route probably a long axis of that route but yet our implant is going you know not quite that much but going that way a little bit so I'd like to see our implant go more like this so this is one of the things I look at uh, in that this might make screw retained a little bit more difficult and have some off-axis forces on this implant so to me the solution for that is to simply tip the implant back like so and as you do that you can see obviously we're going to the mesial but then just distally translate the implant and get it better centered and now we can see if we were to come back and draw those lines again long axis long axis long axis long axis so a little bit better there now so now we can see that in our insertion path for seating for the screw retain restoration we can see how much better that would be uh, and then just uh, one point here is my guess is going to be that uh, in articulation if this were a final restoration that distal buckle cusp would probably be high in excursive movements and the mesial buckle cusp would be a little bit low and so these are the, some of the things I'm, I'm looking at when I'm doing my general CEREC designs I, I, I believe too many of us uh, are a little bit haphazard with these virtual wax ups uh, but I do believe that they're quite important so uh, this is uh, the plan that I would have um, and we can take a peek at that and this is the plan as it was sent to me and and you know in reality we can really see the difference right here so thank you very much for submitting the plan and I hope you found that quite helpful